So I, um, so Shane here, just um, on the iMoot team, and uh, just like to formally welcome everybody to uh, this year's iMoot uh, 2015. And um, the I in iMoot actually does stand for international, so it is great that we have people from all over the world um, joining us. Um, so thank you for making the effort for either getting up or staying up late or breaking into a work day to join us today. Um, kicking off the iMOOC this year is uh, our, our very first keynote, um, which is by Joyce Sightsinger and uh, Jessica Knott. And uh, she used UX methods in her course design. What happened next will amaze you. And uh, so we're all looking forward to being amazed. So thank you very much, ladies. I'll hand over to you. Okay. Well, how exciting. This is so exciting. It's the iMoot. It's, and I believe somebody was saying in the chat that it's the sixth iMoot. So that is incredibly, um, uh, uh, I mean, that's just in, incredible that we're still going and uh, that it just seems to be growing. I think I saw a Vinny tweet earlier that it just grows every year. So it's fantastic. Um, and Jess and I are very excited to be here and to be talking about this topic because it's something that we've only just started to explore. And, uh, and, and Jess and I have only known each other for a very short time. So just before uh, we do anything else, I'd just like to say uh, to everyone from around the world who's joining us, um, either uh, good day from Australia, goedemorgen if you're somewhere in Europe, um, or kia ora if you're from, uh, from, if you're from New Zealand and joining us from there. Uh, Jess, do you just want to hop on the webcam? and just say hi to everyone. Oh, and we seem to have, you seem to be muted, Jess. So we need you off your muted. Let me see. There we go. Not hearing you. All right, great. So Fred is just going to help Jess get started. And um, I will just continue with what we've got so far. Ah, <laughs> oh, yes, she's a fantastic mom. Sometimes we Skype each other, we turn off the sound just for that. Um, so um, I'll just talk a little bit about Jess and myself. So if you're following along on Twitter as well, you can uh, you can follow us both uh, um, at Cat's Pajamas and said, and uh, Jess is at JL Knot. And uh, the picture that you see here is um, from um, uh, the ET4 online conference, which happened about a month ago in Dallas. And that was the first time that I met Jess. And it turned out that both of us actually uh, had um, similar presentations or were actually using similar themes in our presentations. And uh, and the person in the middle that you see there is Laura Paschini, uh, who's at Laura Paschini online. And uh, and she was she's she was a mutual friend, and she said, "Oh, you two need to be talking to each other. You seem to be exploring similar topics." And then it turned out that we did, and we never stopped talking for the entire time that we were in Dallas. And and in fact, we haven't stopped since I've come back to Australia, and Jess has gone back to Michigan, uh, because what we figured out is that the topic that we're both exploring, exploring, which is around using UX methods in course design, um, is something that warrants uh, quite a bit more work. And so what we've done is we've uh, we've 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 actually started a blog together now, and uh, we're going to be exploring it together over the next few years. So it's been really exciting. Now I'm just seeing whether Jess is back in here. I see she is, but her mic is currently muted. Jess, are you back with us? All right. Well, Maureen, I hope that we can uh, that 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 we can demystify it a little bit for you today. Anyway, um, so uh, just a little bit of background about myself. I've got uh, for those people who don't know me, um, uh, I was a long time Moodler um, uh, when I was living in New Zealand. Um, I've uh, recently been working at a university in Melbourne, where I was I was at Deakin University in Melbourne until January two thousand fourteen, and in January I set up. Uh, 
uh, my own company called Academic Tribe, uh, where we provide learning design and uh, learning development services. And, uh, and we've been working with a number of universities uh, since then. All right, just a tip for you, Jess, if you can hear us. Uh, the audio works better in Firefox than Chrome, it says. Uh, Tabitha is just sharing there. Um, and uh, Jess is rebooting. All right, and she might dial into the conference bridge if that's needed. So um, uh, Jessica is uh, a very recent PhD, so you can all just give her a little bit of applause in the uh, in the chat. And uh, Jess uh, is at the uh, uh, is in Michigan at Michigan State, and uh, where um, I've since met lots and lots of people doing very very interesting things. And uh, for instance, another friend of mine has set up a uh, a, a a degree there just recently and um, I think they launched last year and that's all about um, user experience architecture uh, architecture so um, what we're seeing is this whole idea of uh, user experience um, which kind of started in software development and in, and in platform development really started to have a wider application in uh, in non IT fields Okay. Now. So uh, how did Jess and I really get involved in this? And I'm just going to keep on talking until at some point Jess hopefully joins us. Um, so how did Jess and I get involved in this? Well, um, for me, this whole idea of, uh, of of being exposed to to UX design uh, really started when I left the university. Well, actually, it was slightly before I left the university um, in um, in 2014. It would have been about mid 2013 when I started to attend some startup meetings. And um, wh whenever I do like PD sessions um, or or whenever I attend. Uh, uh, edu conferences people always ask me you know how do i stay current uh you know how do i get inspiration i'm always hearing the same things i think one of the best things that you can do is to start actually looking at other disciplines and for me my eyes are really opened when i started to attend the startup meetings and become part of the startup community here in uh, in melbourne first of all they're doing incredibly interesting things um and uh, and and they're and they're a very open community so coming from uh, out of academia that was very interesting in that nobody was really that protective of their ideas. You always think like, oh, startup idea, I mustn't tell anyone. But uh, people are actually quite open about their ideas and quite happy to share what it is that they're learning uh, and what they're working on. Uh, because he had, because in the end, what it comes down to with startups is that it's not so much about having the idea, it's about how you implement it. And uh, and I think in a way that that is a principle that that um, translates to course design as well, which is that you can have the most wonderful ideas, but if you don't actually put it into, into practice, then you're gonna have a pretty boring course. Um, and so what I found there was that not just in talking to these people, but also in working with some of them and then starting to look at uh, developing some platforms of our own, we attended a, st a startup weekend as well, uh, was that I started to get exposed to this idea of UX. And uh, if you've been a learning designer for many years, what you'll find is that there are actually loads of of um, ideas and principles and methods that people use in UX that, um, that actually transfer really well to what it is that we do. I think in a way, uh, most of us learning designers have been trying to be uh, experienced designers all along, but um, quite often the methods that we use and the models that we use, the frameworks that we use, don't actually set us up for success in that area. And, and there are other factors as well. I think sometimes the, the, the role that you get as a learning designer or um, the kind of the late stage at which you are involved, maybe in course design, um, quite often trying to retrieve something um, uh, that has already been set up. Um, it, it, it kind of limits how much you can actually do. But I think at heart, when, when, when any of us sit down and go, well, what are we going to design here? What we want to do is we, design, we want to design an awesome experience uh, for the learners. And so um, I got really excited learning about this uh, user experience method, which is really a methodology and it's really a set of principles for thinking about it. Um, uh, I got really excited about that because I could just see so many applications uh, for the work that we do and in order to, to really start creating those awesome courses. 
Okay, I'm just going to check in with Fred and Shane and see if we have uh, an ETA on Jess. This is Fred. I just saw her appear a few moments ago on the users list. So when she gets back in, even if the microphone doesn't work, she can dial into the audio bridge. We just wait until she comes back in. Should only be a moment. Okay, great. Thank you, Fred. Um, so uh, what I found was that uh, when I went to the conference in Dallas was that uh, Jess was there and she was actually doing a workshop on um, exactly this, using UX methods um, in, um, yeah, I hope she's not at Starbucks either, Siggy. <laughs> so she was actually doing a workshop using UX methods in order to do course design. So obviously I attended and, um, and, uh, and the two of us just got more and more excited about all of these things that we've both been thinking about individually, uh, uh, you know, her in Michigan and me here in Australia. And uh, we kind of decided that, uh, that we should continue exploring this, uh, this side of things. So uh, that's why we've set up, um, that's why we, you know, offered to present today at the, at the iMood. And this is also why we've set the blog so that we can continue to explore this. And, and we really hope that, you know, what we talk about today can actually transfer to, uh, to the work that you're doing. And we'd love to hear from you about how you think that this fits. Okay, I can see Jessica's in the list. I'm just going to interrupt for a moment. Jessica, it doesn't look like your microphone's working. But uh, you could just call into the conference bridge. You'll see the number in the blue welcome text. And just pick up the phone and call in, and then you can you'll be able to speak. Oh, that's a little bit disappointing, but anyway, um, so, and um, I think one of the things that we have to remember is that whenever we talk, we talk about design and uh, for me, um, uh, you know, this is kind of like, as you start thinking about UX design, this is, uh, and you start having initial conversations with people about UX design, everybody kind of immediately goes to interface design and also to visual design. So what does something actually look like? And, um, and, uh, and then you'll quickly also hear people talk about this quote from Steve Jobs, which is that design is not just what it looks like and feels like, but design is also in how it works. And what we're really aiming for is a frictionless experience. And, uh, and I think that anybody, any, any of us who have uh, worked in educational institutions know that quite often for students or even for staff, um, the, the, the experiences that we design are far from frictionless. And so uh, applying UX methods to your course, even if you've already got an existing course, so even if you're not starting from scratch, is one way to start taking some of the friction out, find those pain points and to start removing them one by one. Uh, and um, for Jessica, are you here? Can you hear us? I am. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. But I'm you sound a lot further away than earlier. Yes, I'm on my speakerphone. I do apologize for that. It would just appear that Adobe released a patch just five minutes ago. So just be aware. <laughs> All right, great. Um, so um, I've just been winging it while you've been gone, uh, but it's been good. And uh, I've just gone through how both you and I got to UX and how we uh, how excited we were about meeting up at Dallas in Dallas and finding out that we both were exploring the same topic and um, and that we that we're excited about um, continuing to explore that topic. So um, just talking about the design aspect that that what we're trying to do is really employ UX methods so that we can start taking some of the pain points out of the way that the uh, the learner uh, uh, out of the learner experiences that we design. Uh, would that be about right? Absolutely, you've got it right on the head. Okay, so uh, one of the things that you'll find, and one of the things that's really nice when you start working, uh, when you start looking at what UX is, so UX, you know, it's often referred to as just UX, UX, you'll, you'll hear that all the time, but it stands for and um, and UX uh, has a lot of very talented, the UX field has a lot of talented people working in it. A lot of them come from the graphic design area. And so what you'll find is that there are lots of nice little complicated diagrams like this to explain what UX is and how it relates to all the other forms of design. Um, and what you can see here is that really the big circle is user experience design, but then it has all of these other types of design inside it, like visual design, um, uh, 
information architecture, information design, uh, motion design, interaction design. And, and so UX, you could think about UX as kind of the like, the big holding pattern, uh, the big basket that all of it's in. And then within that, that's got all of its own disciplines. So if you were building a giant platform, let's say Google search, then uh, you might have different large teams working in each of these areas. However, if you are the single learning experience designer uh, trying to uh, trying to support 30 staff in, in, in about uh, 100 courses, then uh, you might pick and mix which which pieces of this that you work on and uh, where you think you're going to get the most bang for your buck. Uh, Jess, anything that you want to uh, add to that? Notice that Tabitha said that that's a crazy diagram, and it really is, but it helps to um, can it illustrate all the different things that you need to think about when you're thinking about uh, learning experience design. So um, I actually really, really like this diagram. It is a little crazy, but once you start to look at it and parse it, you'll uh, feel a little more comfortable, I think. Yeah, and like I said, um, if, you're, if you're into shiny diagram pictures, UX is the field for you. <laughs> Um, so going on to a very, a very much simpler diagram, uh, this is one that, uh, that Jess and I have this, been discussing. And so uh, we've been thinking about, well, what is learner experience design then? So, you know, if we want to think about UX design and how it is applied in, uh, in teaching and learning, um, then, um, then it, it probably pays to look at, um, uh, at learner experience design as a subset of UX, of user experience design. Uh, so that it actually sits within it and it would encompass all of those previous um, uh, different fields and disciplines that you saw in that in that diagram. However, what it uh, um, but the learner experience design is uh, is is a subset of UX because it focuses on a particular kind of user. It, it it focuses on a learning user, somebody who is involved in some kind of learning process. And so uh, that's why we've drawn this diagram as it is with the Lex design as a subset of user experience design. And, uh, and then this is uh, one that's slightly more complicated that we've started to work on. Um, and, uh, but basically, you know, as we've been kind of talking about, okay, so then, you know, what are the, what are the disciplines that we really need to kind of focus on? And what are the ones that really feed into this idea around building a learning learner experience? Um, it's this. And so most of you will be familiar with learning design and you do learning design all the time. Um, but um, but the one that you might not be so familiar with is UI design. Now, actually, we started to talk about UI design as user interface design, and Jess will talk a little bit later about the difference between UX and UI, uh, but user interface design would actually be how you interact with a digital interface like we are doing today through Big Blue, Big, Big Blue Button and like we're doing in the iMood.org site as well. Uh, however, I think now I'm actually leaning toward that not being so much interface design, but more around interaction design, because when you're designing a learner experience, then um, then you're really you should really should be looking at all of the interactions. And some of those might be in the interface and some of those might be, um, um, you know, away from any kind of digital device. It might be how people interact with a resource that you've created, like a handout or a book that that you're expecting people to buy, and all of those things together uh, uh, feed into uh, the central point, which is the learner experience design. Initially, when we started talking about le learner or about LX design, we were actually interpreting LX design as learning experience design. But we wanted to bring it back to that whole idea of coming back to the user and, and what kind of experience are we actually giving the user and focusing on the user and not focusing on the process of that. Uh, Jess? I'm trying to click all of these buttons and make sure that I don't break my computer again. Um, thank you for your patience with all of this. I do apologize. Um, so as Joyce mentioned, user experience design is not the same as user inter interface design. Um, and similarly, learning experience design is not the same as learning inter interaction design. Um, I want you to think a little bit about how Tabitha mentioned that image was um, kind of messy and hard for her to understand. And I want you to think about that and carry it through. I also want you to think about 
the things that um, you think of as interface or interaction. So there's this really interesting website called uxisnotui.com, and basically it's just a place where you can download some PDFs that show you what people think user experience design is and what they kind of think um, user interface design is, so the difference between those. So um, I just realized that you're still looking at Joyce. I apologize for that. So in the uh, UX is not UI PDF that I have up here, people usually think about user experience design as just interface design and visual design. Uh, did any of you think that when you came here today? I heard some people had to look up what UX was. Did anyone think that um, UX design was mostly interacting with the interfaces? Um, you go ahead and comment in the chat window. But as you can see from this PDF, it's so much more. It's really field research and observation and gathering all of this data together to figure out how to create an experience. So a user interface is only one small part of the experience, just like learning experience design is only one small part of the whole user experience field. So think about that a little bit as we move forward. And then Joyce is going to take this slide now and tell you a little bit about some of the competencies that go in. This is another thing that will help you understand some of the um, flow charts and Venn diagrams we've shown so far. Mm -hmm. Yes, so uh, if someone is a user experience design designer, then these are some of the areas that, that they would be, have to be competent in. And I thought it would, be, it would help for us to take a look at that in terms of what we usually do in, when we do course design. And uh, I just want to be uh, to acknowledge that I'm aware that, that Jess and I are both talking about course design very much from, from the perspective of being a education technology support and a learning designer inside a higher education organization because that's where both of us have, have worked. Um, but I think the methods, um, so maybe the examples that we talk about are very much coming from higher ed, uh, but I think the methods are actually applicable no matter which level you're working at, uh, whether it's K through 12 um, or, or higher ed, or whether you're working in corporate training. Um, so uh, we, if you look at the competency of a user experience designer, then um, we'll just go through them one by one. Um, and compare it to how we currently do course design. And uh, so you look at user research and analytics. Well, this is starting to happen. So learner analytics were the big buzzword for uh, in the Horizon report for like the last three to four years running. And uh, they seem to be starting to come mainstream uh, and people are starting to use them in order to inform in, or, or to inform what, what it is that that students actually do inside our, our systems and on our platforms. Um, however, I think one of the biggest differences there is we have all this data, but we're not actually applying that data quite often immediately to our design. So what we might do is we might gather all that data, but it's actually very often even due to policies, we're restricted from actually acting on that data straight away. So I think um, I think this is an area where we can really grow in, uh, in course design and actually start uh, also mapping out that data, not just by you know, what happens to be available in the LMS, but actually in designing the learner activities that would that become part of the of the learner experience, actually also designing what metrics we're going to need for that and what metrics we would be looking to get out and what our goals are uh, for that learner activity as well. So, you know, if I set up a wiki activity, would I expect students to be logging into that every day, um, you know, several times a day, um, you know, and setting some targets for yourself as well about, about um, expected user behavior rather than using the analytics kind of at the end as something that you that that you engage with and then tells you how everybody did at a point where it's really too late for you to do anything about it so that's a little bit about the uh, about that whole side of user research and analytics um, content strategy I think this is where uh, most educational institutions could say that they totally rule we can do content on the LMS we all know how to put it in there we can uh, in fact you know quite often that is the first thing that 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 people get started with and that's often because it's so easy but we're quite good at this point and uh, and, and we quite often uh, quite clear on what content it is that we're going to need as well. Uh, information architect architecture, I think this is one point where we can really do better uh, when, when we do our course design. Um, I think um, certainly some of the um, uh, uh, changes that, that we've seen uh, come out with movement 
Brutal 2.0, and then as Brutal has gone through all of its various iterations, has certainly improved the information architecture that underlies our courses and actually allowed us not to have to double up so much on information. Uh, but I think there's still quite a lot that we can be doing there. Um, Jess, did you want to jump in on that? Yeah, so there are a lot of um, <clears throat> tools out there that can help you kind of figure out your information architecture within your courses. Something like Quality Matters, or any of you Quality Matters institutions. Um, I look at Quality Matters overall, and I think this is really just related to course design, which is what it was de designed for, but it also offers me um, a tangible way to help my faculty that I work with think about information architecture a little differently. So. Um, I agree with Joyce, this is one of the places that we could do better, and sometimes the LMS just doesn't let us. So, um, you know, we only do what we can, right? Yeah, that's right, and that's that's part of that whole, you know, identifying those touch points and then identifying, you know, which ones are really the most painful and, and then which ones you can actually do something about, you know, except the fact that you won't be able to control some things and, and address the ones that you actually can, but quite often our information architecture is actually led uh, by the learning management system that we're that we're working in. Um, so interaction design. And again, this is quite often where people are led by the by, by the LMS, or, you know, in this case, we're talking about Moodle. And uh, quite often people let themselves be uh, uh, be led by the LMS. So the LMS says, at a forum and the people go, oh, it's a discussion forum, so therefore I will use it as a discussion forum and it is now a class-wide discussion. So quite often the, the way that we expect to use a tool then actually leads to our behavior in that tool. But I'll say that there's actually quite a bit that you could do around interaction design in terms of even just giving your students different instructions or setting that discussion forum up in a, it to behave in a different way using ratings, et cetera, to actually make the interactions that the students have, that the learners have in that um, in that space uh, quite different from just it just being a regular um, uh, a, a regular open discussion forum that allows everyone to have a debate so so we quite often let us let ourselves be led by the LMS and I would say don't always just go to the default position and probably when you're working if you're a learning designer learning experience designer and you're actually working with an existing course this is where you can make some gains you know look at how often people have defaulted to the default position and see whether you can bring some changes in there um, uh, I, you know, I'm, I know certainly from my time when I was at EIT looking after looking after Moodle there that if when we ran the stats, what we'd find is that mostly people use the, uh, the, the you know, like the large number of courses would at least have the news forum set up. Some of them might have other forums set up and then quite a few of them, like and then there would be like some real champions who would be using wikis. But the stats were really low and really showing that that not all facilities were really being used. All right, just moving on, uh, visual design. Uh, again, often we are locked down here for branding. Um, I've also worked in institutions where, uh, it, where, for instance, the template or the course design was quite locked down uh, because because people talk about consistency, and I think uh, I think consistency should actually be uh, be uh, subservient um, to uh, to the learner experience that you're trying to design. So just because all of these courses are part of one bachelor of nursing program doesn't mean that they should all be be set up in a different way. One of them might need to take a much more of a portfolio approach. One might be much more around statistics and data, and is going to need very different kind of components. And locking a course down uh, to to a certain kind Kind of structure and to a certain kind of visual design can really impair uh, how you uh, ha what kind of a learner experience you're at, you're able to design. And then the last bit is around front end dev, uh, which is linked to interaction design. And again, so you're kind of limited in how much you can actually develop uh, by um, by what's been locked down in your system as well. Okay. Um. Now, I seem to have lost my controls for the slides. Jess, have you got control over the slide? Ah. So do you. <laughs> okay, that's interesting. <laughs> So uh, yes, yeah, so oh, well, I think we've actually covered a little bit of that in the in the previous slide. But uh, what is the course design that that we currently offer? What kind of learning experiences are we currently are we currently offering? Um, and 
I think what we often try to do is that we actually try to uh, try to go for the safest bet. We just want to make sure that it all works. We want to make sure that that people are able to, you know, get on. We want to make sure that people have access to the content. And, and quite often we, we tend to play it safe. And uh, and I think once you start to look at this whole UX methods that um, that they have to kind of move into a phase of experimentation where you actually try to um, uh, try to uh, try different things, be prepared for them to fail, uh, put things into your courses, be prepared to rip them out again. Um, and, and that also requires a culture shift. It also requires that you that you talk to your colleagues about it. And it also requires that that you talk to your learners about it. Uh, Jess. So I want you to think a little bit right now. I, I keep telling you to think, and I keep putting in the um, chat window, at, you know, asking you to ask questions and um, making sure that we're all kind of on the same page when it comes to understanding. But in a presentation like this, it's really hard for us to measure that. So when you think about your current course design and the user experience of current course design, one of the things that happen, for example, as when we used that overlapping image earlier, we put that in there thinking, wow, this is a really clear way to explain things. To us, that was our understanding of who would be in the room. And then very awesomely, Tabitha was like, wow, that is too hard. I, what is even going on here? That's a mess. So there is a disconnect in understanding. Joyce and I designed an experience that worked for us because we weren't sure who was going to be in the room and we didn't have time to find out, you know, personas wise and, and do some of the testing that I'll talk about a little later. So. Our current course design processes, for better or worse, tend to be a little more faculty or instructor focused than they are student focused. Um, and that's not Oh, somebody just, some noise just happened. Um, I'm, I'm not saying that's universal, but that's, I know when I sit down to develop a course, that does tend to be where I start. Like, oh, I have to teach these things. Um, what we're going to do is kind of help you understand how UX can help you involve your entire team in the development process and also um, help you think a little more about your students um, and who might be in the room. So it's more of a shared experience. Joyce, did you yeah. have any Add. Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, that I think, and this is a personal belief of mine, and I don't think you'll find this supported in very many institutions, but I actually believe that we need to be working a lot more in teams uh, because I don't think that it would be fair for um, uh, uh, lecturers to have to think about all of this and to have to be aware of all of this. And um, I think it's actually, um, I think we need to, when we start designing in this way we actually need to accept that we're going to be designing in teams and that there will be different roles in that team and um and that everybody is part of a ux design process um this is this you know it's not something that you can really do in your own and quite often as the experienced designer you will be the person who actually facilitates that process but it does mean that you have to get some buy-in from everyone um so um just a little bit more about what kind of course um, designs that we usually uh, that we usually design. I think uh, this this diagram is really helpful because it, it kind of shows you. Um, uh, well, it's called the UX hierarchy of needs. I don't think we can quite translate it to Maslow's hierarchy of needs that way. But basically, what it shows is it shows a, pro a progression from uh, providing a, an experience that's really task oriented to um, all the way at the top having a uh, having an uh, experience that's really experience oriented that really focuses on what the user experiences rather than on what the user needs to do and when i think about the kinds of courses that i've generally designed with staff and uh, and the kinds of courses that that i see at universities uh, quite often they are very much stuck at kind of the reliable uh, stage which is that you know they're there you could do things, um, uh, you know, we know that the PowerPoints are going to be in the Moodle. We know that the PDFs are going to be in the Moodle and, uh, and, and we know that the forums will work, but is the, um, is the, um, uh, student is the learner really engaged with that? So if you, if you, I'm not sure whether you can read it, but, uh, basically, um, 
you know, if, if you go up through the levels, the first level of functional is that it works as it's programmed to do. The second is that it is available and it is accurate and you'll know that it's there. Usable would be that it can be used without difficulty. Uh, but then we start to get into the turnaround point at the convenient thing, which is that it is super easy to use and it works like I think. And I think quite often that's where we really struggle um, in order to actually move what we've designed to go above that, where it is just so easy to use uh, that it becomes an experience and, and even moves into the next phase, which it would be pleasurable, which is that it's a memorable experience that you, that is worth sharing that you want to tell other people about. Um, and then uh, uh, particularly once a, an experience can become meaningful and has personal, personal significance, that's really what we should be aiming for. But I think quite often what we do due to um due to limitations in the technology that we're using uh due to limitations in the time that everyone has available to do the experience design we we don't really rise above that level of being reliable i'd just like to point out that my entire dissertation just found i i interviewed um faculty members in a college of education where they're already pretty focused on teaching and found that basically um faculty members without intervention will get to that reliable stage and be like, it works, the students can find it and leave it there instead of continuing to iterate. So once they hit reliable, they go, oh, okay, it works now and I've got a course. And so I really liked when Joyce sent this image because um, I think if we employ some of these methodologies, we can move people beyond reliable without um, you know, making it overwhelming. Uh, so Andy is asking, is there a correlation between convenient and higher levels and better performance? Um, well, that's an interesting one. And um, I would say that um, I would say that certainly when you read some of the UX literature, what you show what you see is that uh, convenience certainly uh, leads to uh, higher participation um, and uh, and um, higher engagement. And so these are two things that we do struggle with in in um, uh, in, in learning design, obviously. Um, but I think this is really interesting because this is where we get into the intersection of learning design and experience design. You know that 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 do does that actually then translate? If we can give a better user experience, does that then also lead to a better learner experience and a better learning experience? And I think that that will be it. And that is some of the work that that Jess and I will be looking at to see whether that actually does make a difference or not. Um, so and, and we'd be keen for anybody who was willing to to try some of the methods that we're developing, uh, you know, to actually do some of those measurements. So so if people are so Andy, <laughs> shoot us an email because we'd love to actually um, uh, actually work on that and see whether some of these methods will actually lead to not just um, a more enjoyable experience, but also a, 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 a higher outcome in terms of the, the, the learning that people do. And I will, Marin asked if um, there were any examples of a before and after type thing. And so what I'll be doing in the next couple of days, honestly, it might be the next week, is assembling some of the courses that I've worked on and getting some examples of the before and the after. And I'll put those on the blog as well and, and in this course space also. Um, so between that and the, I will also look for some of the correlation um, literature to kind of help fill that out a little bit because that's a great question. Okay. Great. We are running just a little short on time, so. Um, yeah, so we're going to get moving. We are going to get moving. Um, as the description mentioned, we have these eight tricks, and these are posted. We already shared the slides in SlideShare. There are some there, and we also have some resources that you can actually use on the blog, lxdesign.co, developed by our own Joy Seitzinger. <laughs> Um, I am up to talk next about personas, and earlier Gar Gareth was asking if um, some of the stuff we were, we were talking about was similar to agile development. And I'm not sure if you are familiar with agile development, but it tends to be a software develop development methodology that keeps constant iteration in the development of products. So if you think about Camtasia, I can tell you for certain that Camtasia was developed using the agile methodology. They're always updating and 
and iterating mm -hmm. on that product. Yes, we can't see that slide. And I've once again lost my lost my um, slide controls. There we go. Cool. I'm, I'm giving you slide controls back. I think you know the um, software is fighting us a little bit today. So mm -hmm. um, anyway. So in agile development, one of the first things the developers do is create a persona. And what that is, is if you think about those BuzzFeed quizzes, or every time you log into Facebook and you take a quiz, you get the, what superhero are you? And um, say, I'm Phoenix from Marvel. Um, that's pretty much putting you into a persona, measuring you against some preconceived um, or prepackaged uh, fictional people that have been developed by by the developer. So um, what personas can help you do, especially in the development phase, is help everybody on a team come to a shared understanding. Um, what you see in front of you is the which Game of Thrones characters are you. Now think about if each one of those people was a student in your course and they all had specific needs and um, skill sets and all that. If you if you kind of put these together in a package and then you develop your course based on those students as though they were enrolled in your course, you'll start to create an experience that's a little more um, universal for the students who enroll. Instead of suddenly going, okay, so I think I'm going to have students who like to read, you're developing a course for the student who likes to read, the student who prefers video, and maybe the student who logs in only once a week. So you've got yeah, the and I, that's right. And I think one of the things that that one of the things, for instance, that I think we can all relate to is the uh, the conversations that you have where people talk about what is it that learners are going to need, and quite often the default learner that everybody is has in their head is the school leaver uh, who's just arriving at you particularly when you're designing a first year course uh, who's just arriving at university and what are they going to need and so the tendency is to try to to put in redundant information and put in a lot of information and so what you're creating is it it's really a journey for that student that kind of covers off all of those possibilities. Well, quite often, and we found this with the with the with um, so the data that we had, for instance, when I was living when I was working in New Zealand, was that actually 55% of our students tended in some of the programs, even higher, uh, tended to be mature age students. These were students who were coming back. They were competent. They didn't want all of that other stuff around it. They just they were very they were highly focused, and they were like, right, let me let me just get through this. And so mapping out all of those all of those uh, users can be really helpful in terms of designing what actually goes into your course and maybe how many different experiences you actually need to design for your course. I think one of the other reasons that personas are really helpful is that at the start of the, um, so I've just recently done this with a MOOC that we're designing and I, we had four of the subject matter experts um, who were working with all in the same room. And the conversation we had about personas went on for about an hour, an hour and a half. And it turned out that even though they, in previous meetings, they had all thought that they were talking about the same person that they were designing for, it turned out that there were actually several distinct people that they all had in their head. And so even facilitating that conversation is a really useful thing to do right at the, at the start of that, uh, of that process uh, so that you can actually get all, everyone who's working with you on the same page. Okay. We do need to move on, and I will move on. I just want to guide everybody's attention to the chat window where uh, Natalie says that her presentation is expanding on the game design frameworks for personas. This is also a piece of game theory, so if any of you are in incorporating game theory into your teaching. Um, so that's just another resource. Also, I just put the link from lexdesign.co that has actual persona templates, example personas, and other resources for you to follow. Joyce, okay. Joyce. Great. So um, uh, uh, one of the other things, one of the other methods, uh, UX methods that I find really helpful and that I can see a lot of applications for in learner experience design is uh, learner journey mapping. And I think Andy was talking about it earlier, or maybe it was Sam, but in the chat uh, around this idea of actually mapping someone's journey. Now, this has become uh, quite customary in, um, in uh, the areas of uh, well, customer service design, um, other kinds of service designs, um, but also in people designing uh, 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 software platforms. How do people get into the platform? How do people move out of the platform? And again, um, uh, this is this is something that is very applicable to what to what we actually do. Um, 
So basically what learner journey mapping would be is uh, an illustration of the sequence of steps that a learner goes through as they interact with all of the aspects of the experience that you've designed. So it might be through Moodle, but it might also be the enrollment form that they got sent. It might also be um, the book, the bookshop form that they had to navigate. It might be the login to the library, et cetera. So all of those different things are part of the same experience for that person. Now you may not control all of that. Um, and, uh, but, but the idea is to try to map as much of it as possible, even when you don't have control over it, knowing that there are those pain points right before it, there are things that you can do at the phase that you do control that can actually retroactively support the learner in, in their process. So uh, making sure that you're mapping all of those steps is it can be a really helpful exercise. Um, so I've just included a few examples of um, uh, this. This is a really interesting one. This one is about keeping graduates green. And a typical way of doing a, some journey mapping is, for instance, by mapping out the different levels and the different spaces in which you're going to be engaging with the learner. Uh, so in this case, they've created uh, five different levels, and then they've mapped exactly what all the touch points. So quite often you will hear this word, touch points, uh, what all of the touch points are that they have with the user. And, uh, and I actually think that this is something like if you look at this, you could see how this could very much apply to like a semester course. Um, uh, but it doesn't have to be quite that linear. It can actually be something that actually shows you what the journey is. So what you see here is a journey map around a volunteer program. And it's all it starts with the before, you know, where is where is the volunteer? How do they get into our program? What is the first thing that they need to do? Uh, then it maps some of the some of the ongoing activities. Then again, there's a really big one around finding a date and time and for groups to sign up. And then there is the actual experience that they start to have. So you can look at these in your own time. And uh, Jess and I also have an awesome Pinterest board where we collect all of these pretty pictures. So uh, and of course, with Pinterest, once you click on it, it'll take you to the original site and you can find out more about the project as well. So um, uh, but this is another example of how you could be um, uh, mapping out a journey. And, you know, this is very doable. Like you can do this, it, like even in PowerPoint, if you set it up to be like a three size, you know, it would be quite easy with just the basic shapes in PowerPoint to create something like this. But it becomes a great talking point also for engaging with your team and engaging with your stakeholders. Um, and uh, there's some great work from UX lady who actually talks about all of the different things that go into building a, a path and kind of layering over the top of it. So it's about sketching the path, focusing on the emotion at each touch point. Is the learner having a good experience or are they having a bad experience? You know, uh, didn't get sent their login until too late. Well, that would be in that in a, a bad experience, uh, you know, uh, but was invited to participate in an icebreaker session as soon as they logged in. That would be a good experience. So, you know, this is how you can map these things. It's very much about mapping the emotions that your learner would have. So it's a little bit around interaction phases. And then also what kind of connections, what, you know, how do you describe each of those touch points and what are the content and interaction of opportunities and barriers that you can find at each of those places. Um, so uh, it can be as complicated as you want. Um, probably doing a paper exercise is a really good way to start, particularly if you're looking at revamping an existing course. I think it's it can be quite helpful to actually map it out this way and then together around a table, really identify the places where there are barriers and then identify barriers that, that you can actually manage and then together addressing how you're going to manage those. Um, and so that can be, uh, you know, done with post-its, et cetera, but it can also just be done in uh, even just a shared table, you know, in a Google Doc that everybody shares and just with happy faces and sad faces indicating what, what kind of an experience people are. I think the real thing is to have it in everybody's face for quite some time, like have it up on a, on a wall somewhere that everybody sees um, so that because what you'll find is that as you start to think about it, you'll come up with other problems or issues or opportunities that you actually see in that journey for the learner. Jess, you want to add anything to that? Nope, we're at about 10 minutes, so we should um, probably All right, move on. speed up a little bit, but that's okay because we're getting into your course is a minimum viable product. So in software development, a minimum viable product is what is usable and 
kind of the bare bones of what you want to get to. Can you release it and can you iterate on it? So this slide is a minimum viable product. There's no image, it's just a headline. Um, this presentation, you can think of this as a minimum viable product because all of the feedback that you're putting into this chat, we're going to take and incorporate into future sessions. We've already got so much good stuff that my writing hand is getting tired. Um, so your course is a minimum viable product. Have any of you, I would like it if you would put in the chat, if any of you have ever taught a course that was completely done when you started it, first off. And second, if you did, did you not make any changes to it throughout the semester? Every course, honestly, I have faculty who just roll out one week. If I can just get this one week done, then I know I can survive the rest. That's a minimum viable product. Learn from that week and continue to iterate. Um, Joyce, did you want to add anything to that? Um, no, but I think that's totally on uh, on part. I think what happens is that six month out, we all think we're going to have this wonderful shiny um, course that is going to run in semester two. And then three weeks before semester two, we suddenly realize that perhaps it's not going to be there. And, uh, and we're quite happy with the MVP and then running out other options as we go. And maybe if we start with that, then, uh, then rather than having to panic at the end, if we start with let's just get MVP up, let's just have it up there, then we can actually decide on what are the most important things of the MVP that we actually want to have up there, rather than having to panic at the end and have to throw up whatever it is that we've got, which may not necessarily be actually the best thing to start with. Mm -hmm. And if I put aside here for the Addy model, I'm a big fan of Addy. For some things, my roller derby name was Addy Mortem. I am a fan of the idea of Addy. The problem is you're evaluating at the end. Really, we should be thinking about evaluating throughout and making changes. So Addy is great, but it takes too long. It's a little bit clunky, and you're really only evaluating once before you go back into that cycle. So think about that when you're thinking about your course as a minimum viable product. Um, I do. Yeah, and Tabitha, you you make a, a a good point there, which is that courses need to be adapted to the particular user group. I think they do. Ideally, they we would we would um, customize them every single time that we start a new semester and that we you know. But how do we find out that information? Quite often, we don't know who the user group is until they're actually enrolled into the course site, and so then we need to put in place some um, some interactions inside the learner experience design that actually help us find out that. Um, yeah. And where personas can help. We put together some personas for this, you know, just basic what we anticipated would happen. But now that we've gone through this experience, we can actually put together more meaningful ones. Um, yeah. We are at 5.53, so I'm kind of a task keeper. <laughs> I I like to keep track of the time. But um, we included in this slide um, call it the ultimate user experience test. And this gives you a framework for thinking about how you might test whether your students are understanding what you understand in the course. So just because you design it and develop it and you use personas and everything is in place, doesn't mean that the same understandings exist between you and your students. So this little spiral framework I've put up, I found it in Smashing Magazine and I really like it. It gives you five steps to make sure that you're all kind of on the same page. You set the, um, it helps you develop that testing. So, um, yeah, and you could do this per activity. So this wouldn't be for like an entire course, but you could actually do this for, you know, the e-portfolio activity you have in week three, the wiki group activity that you have in week in week five, et cetera. And you would go through that through that um, um, test, and every single one of those um, uh, cycles will tell you more about who you've actually got in your course. All right, moving on, and I haven't got control again, so I depend on you, Jess. Let me give that to you. Um, this will be on our blog as well. So Yeah, this is very strange how we can't both have control of this. Um, so which is uh, kind of related to that cycle thing that we were just talking about. So this is around the idea of build, measure, learn, which strictly speaking isn't really a, a, a UX method, but it kind of comes from the lean startup cycle. And what we've done is we've actually adapted it for how you could be using it in your course design. So the and and in lean startup the idea is all about getting to MVP as fast as possible. So they focus very much around building faster, measuring faster, and learning faster about how users are actually engaging with your product. Um, we're not that worried about the fast. We're more worried about the smart. So we've uh, included some ideas about how you can actually build smarter, measure smarter, and learn smarter as you go about your course. And again, this is about you know.
focusing on that constant iteration. So you may have ideas about what's actually going to work during your learner experience. You will build those things, uh, but then you can do incremental deployment. So rather than you know waiting for that whole course to be finished, you can actually start to release things uh, module by module, um, and and looking at the activities that you find as sequential experiences rather than uh, trying to design the entire experience in one big go. Having some simple prototypes is a great way to go that you can put in the field uh, that you can get feedback on. Um, you know, like we said, today's presentation is a bit of a prototype for us as well to, to, in order to kind of hear from other learning designers and other people who work in learning design, uh, you know, where they see these ideas fitting in. Um, so once you've built, the, built it, then your users will go through the experience and that at that point you will need to be measuring what it is that is actually happening. And you can do that through having ongoing usability tests. These don't need to be very big. We'll talk a little bit more about usability. You can do some A-B testing. Um, it's very important, I think, that you're very clear on who the course owner is or who the experience owner is. If you're doing something new, uh, like for instance, introducing a, a pretty complex wiki activity, then, um, uh, then you could actually say, all right, I will be the experience owner here as the learning designer. I won't overload the staff member that I'm working with, with having to track all of that, I will actually go in, I will see what students are, in, are doing and what the learner behavior actually is. And then the last bit is around, you know, all of the data that you gather is to actually be able to be acting on that and, and, and getting some insights from that all the time. So make sure that you know which data it is that you're looking for and don't just restrict yourself to the data that you can get from the LMS. There may be other places you can actually get data, the library, the help desk, uh, there will be other places where data around your learner's behavior is being gathered and uh, try to get access to those as well. All right. Usability testing, Jess. Oh, we haven't got your, your mic on. That's because I forgot I'm on my phone. Sorry. So, um, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on usability testing. We've already talked a little bit about it and how to figure out what your students are doing. Um, some of the things you could do is fire up Camtasia and then give them a few tasks. Do they find the syllabus? Do they find the quiz in module one? Things like that. You can record it and see where the common misunderstandings are. And one of the resources we really like, Joyce and I both enjoy the book, uh, Don't Make Me Think. It can help you um, figure out how to create an experience for your students that is as easy for them to navigate as possible, which is unlike most learning management systems in the world. Um, as Joyce put it, every learning management system UI ever, it's, wait, is that, do I click on that or do I click on the folder? What do I click on? Um, 559. Joyce, why don't you close us out here with the rest of the methods? All right, um, let's see. I haven't got access um, once again. Um, so, but uh, basically, yes, yeah, some A-B testing is some easy ways that, that you can actually uh, try to test um, uh, how effective an interaction that you're going to design is by uh, putting two different versions in the field. Now, um, sometimes it can be quite difficult to actually kind of manage which, which user something is going to be released to, particularly when you're working inside like a Moodle site, you might not know who's coming in and uh, when they're going to be there. So, um, and it might, and, and, and you're kind of restricted in, giving everybody the same experience. But one of the ways that you, for instance, do this is by creating two different versions of a graphic, maybe a graphic even at the top of a page or uh, moving a particular headline to the top of a page and keeping it up there for 24 hours and seeing whether the engagement that you're getting on that uh, object that you've just added to your course is actually different or has a higher kind of uh, participation rate than um, uh, than than the, the traditional way that you had the course set up. Um, so A-B testing, basically anything um, that you can change, you can test, right? So any any kind of object that you've got in your course that you can change, you can test. And so that's headlines, calls to action. I think uh, for us, it would also be, uh, for instance, interesting in trying to see how much traction you get on traditionally underutilized uh, objects in a course, like for instance, the self-test that the students can do or a checklist that they need to do. And are there things that you can change around how that is presented by adding a graphic to it, by adding a different kind of headline, by changing its positioning in the course that actually then makes it uh, uh, makes it more um, 
makes people engage with it more. And so I think uh, doing this purposefully kind of A-B testing, not changing everything in the course, but changing one thing and then taking a look at how that actually um, uh, changes people's participation in the course, I think is can be a real way of identifying some things that work. And a lot of different A-B tests, one after the other, will start to tell you quite a bit about who the user is and who you've got in your course. Okay, then uh, I just want to wrap up and I realize that people are going to be going shooting off to different uh, to different sessions as well. Uh, but the other two things that we've included in here and again, there will be more information on the blog is around card sorting. Um, uh, which is um, uh, basically a facilitation method that you can use at lots of different points in your in your learner experience design, and then also uh, surveys um, and uh, and basically our big message around surveys is to stop being so worried about surveying your students um, that this is something that's people are getting quite used to and it doesn't have to be a huge long survey and doesn't have to be everyone in the course who surveyed uh, sometimes just a small sample size and a few questions can be enough to tell you where um, where some uh, uh, some gains can be had so just in summing up uh, what we'd like to leave you with is to design for the learner and not for yourself to design for agility and not for stasis and to design for experiences and not for content and if it's not just a little bit uncomfortable, then, you know, try to find something else to incorporate. Um, I found that it was hard for me to make this change. But once I did, I'm, I'm very happy now. And so are my faculty that I work with. Okay, so with that, um, sorry about just losing a little bit of time at the top there as we were trying to get the technology sorted, but you know, that's part of this. It's been great being part of iMood again. I really look forward to um, uh, to the next few days of engaging with all of you in all of the other sessions and talking about this more. And if you do want to, if you are interested in, in continuing to engage with us, we have set up the blog. We'll be doing more talking about that there. We'll, we'll definitely be um, asking Perinia, uh, who's been doing a lot of work in New Zealand around this as well. We'll be asking her to do some guest blogs for us. And uh, yeah, keen to hear all of your feedback about how this could work. And uh, you can engage with both of us on Twitter as well, at Cats Pajamas and Zed, at JL Not, And we will be in the iMood 15 stream anyway. OK. This has been really fun, you guys. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, everyone. And uh, yeah, we hope to, uh, we'll, we'll see you over the next few days and, and keep chatting. Hey, Joyce and Jess, this is Shane. I uh, just wanted to thank you both for giving up your time today and giving us an excellent start to the iMoot. Uh, thank you very much and encouraging everyone to keep the conversation going as well. Thanks, Shane. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. <laughs>